Welcome to Harvard University Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies program on critical issues confronting China. Uh, tonight, today is the second in our uh, series, uh, every uh, Wednesday noon at 12.30. And uh, our speaker for today is Lily Wu. When Lily Wu was uh, a young uh, finance officer in Hong Kong, uh, she worked for a guy named Bill Overholt. And so uh, Bill Overholt, uh, who's one of our uh, pillars of our uh, weekly series, uh, is going to introduce her. Uh, she's going to speak, and then I will manage uh, questions at the end. Uh, Nick, do you want to come on and explain how the questions work? Let me make sure here. No, I'm now you are. Good, okay. My apologies. Um, so those of you who have attended these before will know the drill, but there is a Q&A tab on, on your um, control screen for Zoom, um, usually at the bottom. If you have questions that occur to you throughout the talk or during the Q&A session, please submit them to that tab. I believe there is an option to submit them anonymously, and this is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube page. So. Um, please do be conscious of that when asking the question. If you would like to submit a question anonymously, um, we, will, we will read it as anonymous. If not, please put your name and your affiliation um, so that we know who's asking the question. Um, we probably won't be able to get to everybody's questions because there's always a lot, but we will try to do as many as possible. So thank you all um, and we'll get started now. And now Bill over, Bill? Oh, it's a pleasure to introduce Lily Wu. Uh, Lily has a civil engineering degree from Caltech and did postgraduate work in history at Peking University. I met Lily exactly a quarter century ago on a Saturday afternoon in a, a headhunter's office. And I was a research manager in Hong Kong looking for a new analyst. Lily was moving from a job uh, at a British investment bank and was planning to start at Nomura on Monday. And uh, somehow the headhunter brought us together. Lily put her hand on her hips and looked at me a, a little bit below her and said, why should I be talking to you? Uh, an hour later, we decided she'd go to work for me on Monday instead of no more. Uh, very quickly, she became a leader in our convertible bond business. She was a very young woman at the time, but she would take these wealthy CEOs of Taiwan tech companies and turn them into her pupils. Uh, she would teach them about finance and teach them how to give a speech, teach them how to position their firms, uh, and made us the leader in that business in Asia. Uh, pretty soon she was too big for us. Uh, she went to Solomon Brothers, and during the dot-com boom, she was the number one tech analyst in Asia. That was a very big deal. She was so successful that Solomon asked her to move to Silicon Valley and become their overall head of tech research. Um, when she got off the plane, they explained to her that in a surprise move, they had hired a whole tech team from another uh, firm and instead of what they had offered her, they would like her to fit in with the, uh, the group they had just imported. Uh, being Lily, uh, she told them to do something unmentionable to themselves and quit on the spot and called me up and asked for help in getting into Stanford Law School to become a public interest lawyer. Uh, she didn't need any help from me in getting into Stanford Law School. But on the way to becoming a lawyer, she got uh, enticed to be a CFO of a rising tech firm. 
she's now the chief investment officer of China Prosper Group, uh, a Taiwan private equity firm. Uh, she's going to tell us about the investment environment in China. There is nobody in the world more qualified to do that than Lily. So, Lily, over to you. Thank you very much, Bill. And thank you more than, more than I can express um, for your valuable support and mentorship through the years. And thank you also to the Fairbank Center. It is an honor to speak to such a distinguished audience today. My topic is investment in China. And before I start, I'd like to mention that I will be making some use of the common language of investment which is financial analysis. CEOs and economic leaders can sometimes spin words and opinions, but financial results of companies, their profits and losses are where truths are revealed about both companies and their markets. So with that, I will begin. Over the past 30, 40 years, China's incredible economic growth has been heavily driven by investment. This is unlike most world economies, either emerging or mature. Consumption is usually the pillar of GDP, but not in China, not a decade ago and not now. Investment is China's key GDP foundation and driver. So what drives investment? A smaller portion of investment comes from public, what the government invests. And this is typically driven by things like infrastructure needs, housing needs, job creation. It's even driven by corruption. And this is true everywhere in the world. A key source of politicians and bureaucrats skimming is via investment projects. A more significant source of investment is private. And that comes from companies, funds, and citizens, both domestic and foreign. Private parties investing is driven really only by one factor, and that is the prospect of making a profit. So along those lines, let's look at profits in China. We know you could sell a billion pairs of chopsticks in China, but can you make money doing it? What's the profit situation? I start here looking at two new economy leaders, Baidu, which is China's search engine leader, and Tencent, the owner of WeChat or Weixing. They enjoy near monopoly situations in China because their international competitors are basically banned. Yet, despite having 1.4 billion consumers to themselves, they lag their US comparables, both in absolute profit dollar terms and also in profit margins. In the Baidu case, it's not even close. And similarly in other sectors, the pharmaceutical sector, Sinopharm is China's largest state-owned pharmaceutical company Hung Rei is the largest private pharmaceutical company. And you could see here in absolute profit dollar terms and also in profit margins, they are dwarfed by US pharma companies. In the fast food sector, a uh, less lofty sector, Young China is the owner of Kentucky Fried Chicken, Pizza Hut, and a number of other local nationwide chains in China. And again, you can see Young China's profit dollars, but most importantly, its profit margins are, are very pale compared to a global standard, say McDonald's. Shanghai Automotive, SAIC, is the largest automaker in the world's largest car market. And yet here too, as we compare it with General Motors, 
you can see that it's profit dollars and profit margins are again inferior. The Industrial Commercial Bank of China is the world's largest bank by assets, but only 1% return on those assets. If we take even a single company's China profits versus worldwide profits, we find that in General Motors' case, yes, they sell more cars in China than anywhere else. Last year, they sold 3 million cars in China compared to 4 million cars in all other markets combined. Yet in China, they earned only 366 operating profit dollars per car compared to over $1,000 per car worldwide. We know this situation happens in a number of industries. For example, Microsoft and Adobe, their software is very popular and commonly used in China, but they also face significant unlicensed use of their software so that their average revenue and profit per consumer in China is actually quite low. So yes, China is a very large market. In some cases, it's the largest market, but it's not necessarily the most profitable. Not only is the profit less, as an investment analyst, I like to see what the trend is. Low profit is okay if the trend is upward, but here we find that the trend is surprisingly often not favorable. Let's look at the national star Alibaba. Despite a stellar, amazing 42 times, 42 fold increase in revenue over the last 10 years, we see that its gross profit margins has steadily declined from 70% down to last year's 45%. Its operating profit margin initially improved with the increased scale of revenue, but that peaked in 2014 and the operating margin has been downhill ever since. As an investor, this scenario is very disappointing. In fact, it's unusual. What we expect to see is the Amazon picture. Typically, when a company greatly expands in revenue and comes to dominate its market, as both Alibaba and Amazon do, they obtain a profit advantage and economies of operating scale so that its profit margins steadily increase. And we see that in Amazon as it has grown over 10 years from 48 billion to 280 billion in revenue, it's uh, 280 billion in revenue, its gross margins have doubled. Its operating profit margin has increased steadily from 1% to 5%. And we also see that in absolute terms, Amazon's revenue is much larger than Alibaba's, even though Alibaba actually processes more transactions per year than Amazon. Of course, Amazon faces, uh, of course, Alibaba faces uh, competition in online sales. But even, for example, the Baidu case, which has no search engine competition in China, we see that it has steadily declining profit margins, despite also a very impressive increase in operating scale. And international companies are not exempt. Back to the General Motors case, we, we know that even though its operating profit per car is lower in China than in other markets, it too is on a downhill trend. The reason for this is primarily intense competition. China is the largest car market in the world and the largest market in the world for many products, but it's also highly competitive. For example, in the car market, there are 42 passenger car makers in China, only four in the US. And so what we see is that basically in these financial results and numbers, for many companies in China, the profits have actually turned out to be not that great. And the profit margins 
as the years go on, fall in a downward slope. For local businesses, China is their home market, so they are not going anywhere. But for the international businesses, they have a choice. And they have gone through what I refer to as an eight-step program, where 40 years ago, they started out with, wow, China, the last large untapped market. And then you have the China department telling headquarters, don't worry, upfront costs will be justified in the long term. And before you know it, they're telling headquarters, we need to invest to show market commitment and goodwill. And ever after, a steady stream, a steady drumbeat of increasing requirements, meet local content, meet local partner requirements, meet localization requirements. And in recent years, even profit reliability and predictability has been challenged due to the politicization of the business environment and also steadily rising costs. So in the end, the profits for many companies turned out not to be quite the windfall that they had expected, and if anything, increasingly pressured. So what we've had is a large body of corporate business challenger, uh, business champions increasingly these days becoming policy challengers. There's no market, there's no magic to this transition. It's not political, it's not sentiment, it's not an attitude change, it's really just business. It's weak profits that have gotten weaker over the years. And more than just being policy challengers, we even have examples of say McDonald's, which we re referenced earlier. They got out altogether in 2017. In that year, McDonald's sold the whole McDonald's China company to Citic and Carlisle, who now operate McDonald's China and license the use of the brand name. Mm. Mm. So that's the private investment picture. What about public investment? Well, public investment, the situation is a bit different. If anything, here we see that China is almost a victim of its own success. Many of the key drivers to public investment actually don't apply anymore. For example, for infrastructure, China has amazing infrastructure among the best in the world. Um, this requirement is basically no longer necessary. In fact, they have been so successful that one of the reasons for Belt and Road campaign was to invent more projects for China's infrastructure companies to undertake. Hmm. Housing is no longer a pressing need as the rate of population growth has slowed considerably in recent years. Even corruption has tamped down considerably with the recent six, seven years of anti-corruption campaigns and also significantly restricted funds flowing to regional governments and greater currency controls has really put a cap on a lot of corruption. So in the public investment area, the only two significant drivers remaining are the support and fostering of strategic industries and also defense and security. In these two areas, I have two case studies I'd like to share with you. Firstly, we all know perhaps that a major strategic industry focus for China now is semiconductors. There is some 700 billion yuan in public investment dollars available at all levels of government, central, provincial, and municipal to support and foster semiconductor businesses. So how is China's semiconductor industry? Have these public investments been effective? Well, let's look at financial results. Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, SMIC in China, is their largest and most advanced IC producer by far. It was founded with public funds 
and to this day, over 30% is government owned. Through 20 years since founding, it has grown steadily with ready access to capital from multiple listings in New York, in Hong Kong, and in Shanghai. Here, I'd like to compare it with SMIC's direct global competitor and industry leader, TSMC of Taiwan. These two companies have identical business models. Yes, TM TSMC was founded 13 years earlier, but SMIC has had 20 years to develop. If we look at a snapshot of last year's results, we see that the companies are not even close. TSMC's revenue is 10x that of SMIC's. TSMC's operating and gross profit margins are outstandingly higher than SMIC's. TSMC spends 5x on research and development than SMIC. And perhaps most importantly, leading edge state-of-the-art technology chips accounted for less than 4% of SMIC's output last year, compared to half of TSMC's output. Now going forward, will all the government investments close or narrow this gap? Well, I can't say, and I don't know about the future, but as I look back 10 years, I see that actually the gap between the two companies is wider today than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago in 2009, SMIC had 39% of its output at the then state-of-the-art leading edge technology. And over the years, its state-of-the-art leading edge technology output has only diminished in percentage. The challenge for China's semiconductor industry and a number of other industries is that they're chasing a moving target. Yes, there is a lot of uh, investment from China, but so too is there globally. <laughs> What we see is that while there are public funds available in China of $100 billion for investment, in last year alone, U.S. semiconductor companies spent $72 billion in research and development and capital equipment. And that does not even include what semiconductor companies in Taiwan, in Korea, in Japan, in Europe have spent. And so while China moves forward, so does the rest of the world. And this gap in spending we see in a number of industries. SMIC's research and development outlay compared to Samsung's, compared to Intel's, or in the search engine field, Google's research and development spend is 10X that of Baidu's. We see this gap in social media, in mobile phones, in automotive, and in pharmaceutical. The research and development spend dwarfs what is spent in China. These financial figures help us really to quantify what the gap is between China companies and their international competitors in select industries. Here too, we see the result of the Weak, weaker profits that we mentioned earlier. If you make less money, you have less money to spend. And so this becomes a bit of a, a negative cycle, which is hard to break. You make less money, so you have less to spend. You spend less, and then you make less, and, then, and so, forth, so on and so forth. Looking at a different case, interestingly, here we have a public investment focus in defense and security five companies who are in the artificial intelligence, AI industry. In particular, they are in visual character and pattern recognition markets. Here we find a different sector. These China companies are world leaders in their segments. They have dominant market shares, sizable annual revenues, and they have high and stable profit margins 
which befits their status as global market leading companies. This sector also benefited from public support, but in a different way from the semiconductor industry. They were not seeded by public funds. All five of these companies were private entrepreneur founded. In fact, two of these companies, DJI and SenseTime, had gotten their start in Hong Kong. Then for expansion, they attracted venture capital and private equity funds who invested solely on the prospect of making big IPO gains in the China stock market, which they pretty much all got. And so this is a case where the public support came, but in the way of having a very rewarding stock market infrastructure. As an aside, I do wanna say that here we have two cases, one a lagging industry and another a leading industry. And you may wonder why one way or another. In my almost 30 years of investing in China, I have noted that China companies' successes tended to come in three areas. One area is in new industries, where basically everybody around the world is starting from square one. So the China companies have as much chance as anyone else of success. And we see this in areas like FinTech, they're aggressive and, uh, and leading edge use of mobile payments. Also in areas like consumer apps with TikTok, which is in the headlines these days. Mm -hmm. Another area of common success is in mature industries where basically industry standards are long fixed and globals have either moved on or moved away or complacent. And we've seen this in areas such as light industry manufacturing or railway cars for high speed. Finally, another area where they have fared well or where China is relatively less regulated than in other regions. And this has seen success in areas like petrochemicals, mining, metallurgy. The areas where the China companies tend to be most challenged are ones where one, they're late to the game, and two, a rapid pace of development still exists. And this is where we see lagging performance in sectors like semiconductors, pharmaceutical enterprise software, just to name a few. So that is an aside about lagging and leading situations. But getting back to China's investment driver for economic growth. So what we have seen now is that with private investments, the key driver has transitioned away from companies looking for profits to investors, entrepreneurs, and funds looking for stock market gains. If we come back to the SMIC case, we see that despite being the least profitable and least advanced of these three chip companies, it's SMIC's share price performance that has outperformed the whole group. In fact, actually, as of two months ago, SMIC's one-year share price performance was up 300%. But in the last month, it quote unquote fell back to earth being up only 98% because the US is threatening to cut off SMIC's access to US equipment and supplies. The price earnings ratio is a common stock market metric for measuring stock market value. So SMIC's 112 times means that for $1 of SMIC profit, it can enjoy $112 of stock market value. Poor Intel, $1 of profit, it only gets $9 of stock market value. So you have a situation where Intel is making 450 times more profit than SMIC, but its market value 
is only 12 times greater. And we see the share price performance situation. So this is the magic and the draw of the China stock market. And to keep public investor funds flowing, the government has been making major regulations this year. China's stock market used to be one of the hardest to IPO in. For example, companies had to be already profitable to even apply for an IPO in China. However, in just the last couple of months, we see that the first batch of pre-profit companies made their IPO debut in the Shanghai stock market. In fact, two of the four stock markets in China are transitioning from IPO applications to IPO registration. What that means is that before, you had to apply for permission to do an IPO in China. Now, you just register the fact that you're going to IPO. So Can you explain is, what to our audience, a non-specialist, what IPO is? Yes, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, IPO is an initial public offering. What that means is that a private company doing an IPO means that it, it goes public on the stock market. It has an initial public offering. Um, you know, Airbnb has been a private company up to now, and they are getting ready to do an IPO. That means Airbnb will make a public offering on the NASDAQ stock exchange and become a public listed company, and everybody could buy shares. Um, this is when a company can really pop in value. Uh, and and uh, in the U.S. and in global markets, IPO registration is the standard. Companies fulfill basic requirements, and then they register that they will IPO. In China, they have always made that very restricted. You have to apply for permission. The regulators get to say yes or no. And this was a very time consuming process. So IPOs took well over a year to process the application before. And now this year with the registration, we're seeing that these companies were able to register in less than two months. International funds are also attracted, uh, are also welcome in China to join this. And for the first time ever, regulations or deregulation, I should say, occurred allowing international fund companies to, for the first time, majority own their businesses in China. And also, they will be able to sell select financial products to the domestic market. The IPO, really to summarize, that's when big riches get minted. That's when $1 becomes $112. That's where your, your big investment gains come in. So the, the regulations regarding IPO is a major linchpin to attracting funds. And this number of listings, this is the number of companies publicly listed. We see that even in the COVID year, the China exchanges are sailing away, business as usual, a ready clip of IPOs, companies going public. At this rate, the Shanghai Shenzhen exchanges may soon outstrip the U.S. exchanges in the total number of companies listed. And public investments are now increasingly used in tandem with private in a kind of public-private fashion. A few reasons for this is one, as we discussed earlier, there aren't too many big public projects anymore, like in infrastructure. A second major reason is because, as we discussed, a key driver now for, for public investment is industry development. And the state recognizes in China that private entrepreneurs and investors tend to have a better track record when it comes to industry development. But finally, we have the carrot situation. The public funds are being used to steer private money into areas of strategic policy alignment. When private investment is going into approved sectors, 
and approved companies, they can get matching public funds and other subsidies. In fact, the state banks can offer them favorable loans, favorable terms on loans. The stick on the flip side is that the regulations are being used to limit non-approved projects in non-approved sectors. So for example, companies in property, in luxury consumption, in low value added industries, they basically aren't even allowed to go public in China anymore. Also, international investments, moving money from China abroad is now highly restricted. Basically, the doors are shut for China money making offshore investments. So no more buying real estate in California or luxury hotels in New York City. In summary, we find that throughout the period of Gaige Kaifang, 40 years of spectacular economic development, investments has been and still is in GDP and GDP growth. However, the nature of investments has changed. Early on, we had foreign companies seeking profits, but who now face headwinds. Public investment drivers, as we see, are less needed now, less pressing. Domestic private companies have had some of the best success stories over these 30, 40 years. But in recent years, they face a resurging role of both state regulations and of state companies. And so now we have venture capital and private equity funds and the stock market stepping up to be the new key investment driver for both GDP growth and the country's desired industrial advancement. Will this be a sustainable driver? Is this a good strategy? Well, we shall see. Thank you everyone for your attention and interest. Thank you very much for educating us and for giving us such a clear picture of so many issues that we know so little about. Now, if I were a czar in uh, uh, China and a czar in the United States, if I were the czar in China, I might say, okay, we have lower profit rates, but our companies are growing a lot. And so for the overall uh, size of the economy, uh, that's such a bad thing. America is for a bunch of capitalists making a lot of money uh, and very high profit rates, but we are promoting what's really good for our country's growth. Uh, what would uh, you say to a Chinese uh, leader who made that argument? Well, the, the, the Chinese situation though, and again, you know, unfortunately, wearing my, my only hat that I know, the investor hat, is that, um, yes, it seems more distributed than in the U.S. And the U.S., you know, we're definitely battling with a concentration of profits. There, the competitive markets and competitive environments, say what we were looking at, the auto industry, the profits are more distributed, um, and every company is smaller, but actually... That too is, is destructive. Too many, four, com, four car companies may be too few, but 42 is too many. So we end up in both cases, say the US or the China model, honestly, neither is, is ideal. And even within the semiconductor industry, which I discussed earlier, we have the situation where, as you saw on the map, every province is now making their own semiconductor champion. Every city has their semiconductor champion. They're too similar to the car market. They run the risk of having too many semiconductor companies and mutually destructive. Nobody has the economic scale to, to front the R&D needed to fight Samsung, Intel, TSMC to catch up and close the gap. So, you know, I, I see what you say about the concentration in the U.S. and the, and the, disparate, the, the, the distribution in China, but actually both are a little bit extreme. Uh, here is a question from Tsung Tony Sun. 
He says, with the recent challenges faced by SMIC and Huawei being locked out of the global chip market suppliers, how can China solve its chip dependency issue? You know, that is a major challenge. Right now, their big focus is first to eliminate U.S. ties. Um, so there will be a um, increased reliance on, say, Korean, Japanese, European, Southeast Asian, and even Taiwan uh, um, semiconductors. And at the same time, there is an aggressive push for semiconductor companies in China to develop um, because while they are moving away from the U.S. and into buying from other markets, they are also preparing for what if Europe cuts us off? What if Japan cuts us off? Um, so they feel they're racing against time. This year, um, this is probably going too much in the weeds, but uh, this year, a lot of the U.S. company, I mean, the China companies like Huawei have been double booking banking inventory, buying two, three years worth of chip supply um, to get ready for the winter, if you will. And then when that runs out, they're just hoping that they can, the second line of defense is to rely on um, non-US chips from say Japan and Europe. And then the final line of defense is that hopefully by then their own industry has grown up. But as you see in the, in the um, case study that I gave you, it's, it's not that simple. SMIC has had 20 years, a lot of capital, and actually their gap isn't really narrowing in many key metrics. We measure it just, as I mentioned, with the numbers. It's in the black mm -hmm. and white. Um, it's not a, you know, um, opinion. Um, so can they do this moving forward? It, it, that really remains to be seen. Here's a question from Dan Murphy, and I want to tack on uh, uh, my question at the end of his, but here's first his, his point. Foreign companies are seeing diminishing profits in China. These same companies have often served as a ballast to bilateral relations between China and the home country. What are the political implications of falling profits? How much has this ballast lightened the U.S.-China relationship or other bilateral relationship? That's his question. But my question comes from a slightly different understanding. My understanding is that a lot of the uh, managers of U.S. companies, very good companies in China, are still seeing relatively high profit rates and want to stay there. It's their home office that has uh, more negative re attitudes toward China. Uh, but that the home, the, the people out in the field are in the major U.S. companies in China are still quite uh, pleased with there. And despite all uh, the, the recent Shanghai um, Chamber of Commerce survey shows that the, the companies out there don't want to leave. So what is your take on both of those related questions, different viewpoints? Yes. Well, you know, it's, it's all in the degrees. You know, nothing is extreme. They're not all in or all out. They're not all losers or all winners. And, and so definitely, you know, the whole gamut of, 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 uh, of interest to stay and to, to push uh, relations exists. Um, but definitely within that, and, and, you know, even in the GM case, you know, $366 of profit per car. It's not as much as global, but it's better than a poke in the eye. I mean, it's still $366 on 3 million cars. So, you know, for sure they want to be there. There's no doubt about it. But, you know, uh, it is in the degrees. What used to be a very uniformly um, a cheerleading group of corporate America now has fractured. Um, you know, that core is not so uniform in terms of cheerleading. It's not to say they don't exist anymore. Um, it, you know, it's not to say they, they don't like or don't want China anymore. But a, a few things, I think, you know, the declining profit issue that has been, and certainly as an investor, I've been seeing it for years, actually. What, what's been a bit of a, a deal breaker or a game changer recently is the politicization of the 
commercial environment. This has added unpredictability. As a business manager, as an investor, if I know my margins are, are going to creep down a point a year, I could plan for that. I could do cost cutting. I could do outsourcing. There are things I could do about it. But when politicization occurs and unpredictable things happen, well, well then, you know, you know th that's a different ballpark. And that makes it um, hard to, to, to plan. It makes it hard to stay. It, it, it's just a, it's a different ballpark. The other issue is also um, many of the things which have, we all knew went on all through the years, like for example, I, IP protection, um, uh, IP violations, I should say, and also the other creep that I mentioned, um, local content was okay. Local partner was also okay. The localization for many has been a deal breaker. The localization means that for some companies, you're, you have to divulge your software. You have to hand over your software locally. You have to keep all of your data centers in China physically. You have to handle all of your algorithms in country. This localization requirements goes above and beyond what any other country requires. US, for example, Europe, nobody asks that, oh, Apple, if you sell a phone here, you have to give us all your software and all your chips and all your designs and all your IP, and you have to make it here. That doesn't happen anywhere. Those are that last few steps were, were just steps too many for a certain number of companies. And as I said, you know, many companies, they're happy to stay. Some companies, McDonald's, they sold out and left, you know, so the whole gamut exists. But I would say 30, 40 years ago, when opening started, everybody, it, the, the, the draw of the market was incredible. Everyone was on board. Everyone was a cheerleader. And now everybody is calculating their own situation. So it, it's in the degrees. It's, it's not that nobody is there. And in that regard, the ballast is definitely lighter. Um, companies which used to be wholly supportive and willing to, and urging the US government to make nice on all points are saying, oh yeah, IP protection, don't forget that you know, that kind of thing. So, so it's all in the degrees. It, it's not a black and white picture for sure. When I was uh, following Japan's situation uh, pretty closely, I noticed that uh, some companies who were not doing well went to politicians in Washington and complained, but companies that were doing very well were quite quiet. I wonder if uh, some of the division uh, in among American uh, businesses in China uh, is giving a rather unbalanced picture in, to Washington to the politicians. Would you say that the companies that are not doing well uh, are going to Washington and therefore they get a rather bad impression, but there are a lot of companies that are doing rather well that are keeping quiet so that the politicization does not really represent a fair overall balance of the profit. Would that be true or not? Um, you know, it, it's hard for me to say, but, but, I, but the, the, some of the recent issues, or not so recent issues, they're real issues. You know, like for example, uh, uh, you know, one of the most common uh, IP violation or demands for localization, you know, demands for turning over um, source code. Um, that, of course, that doesn't impact everyone. A caterpillar doesn't need to care about that kind of problem. Um, <laughs> but is that a problem? Yes, it is definitely a problem. You know, it, whether that impacts only five companies or 50 companies, you know, that's a problem. It, it's, <laughs> um, so, so it's hard to say, you know, how representative the squeaky wheels are, but um, but I, I would I would posit that um, the issues being brought up really are issues, and and it is also a market equality issue because uh, say uh, other global markets do not have similar requests. Um, you know the the U.S. or for example Europe does not require um, source code uh, divulging. Um, 
Here's, here's another re a question related to that by Meyer Aiken. He says, do you see evidence that either de jure or de facto localization requirements have gotten better, gotten worse, or stayed the same and uh, uh, over the last couple of decades? And also on the question of IPR, uh, of intellectual property. Uh, I've heard some people say that if you compare it years ago, uh, the Chinese have taken uh, steps to protect intellectual property. How, what do you see as the trend uh, in, the, in those uh, uh, ways in which they're uh, dealing with foreign companies? Uh, um, I apologize, Ezra. I didn't quite catch the beginning. Um, I know what you mentioned about the uh, IPR. Um, uh, has that improved? But what was the first portion of the question? Okay. The, the first one is, and see the de jure. It's a, it's a basically a more general statement of some of the same things. Do you see evidence of de jure de facto that localization uh, requirements have gotten better or worse? So what are, what are the trends in the way that the Chinese government is treating uh, foreign business? Is it, uh, is it some ways uh, getting more to follow international rules or is it increasingly nationalistic? Or is it just the fact that Chinese companies are doing better and competition is worse? Yeah, no, what, actually, what, what the, the, like? yeah, the localization requirements, this actually doesn't have to do with whether how the Chinese companies are doing. The, the localization requirements were, in, in my um, reading of it, always born out of security concerns, defense concerns. You know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a commercial competitive thing. Oh, I want you to localize so my China companies can have an advantage. Uh, many of the localization issues, I, I believe, were born more out of defense and security considerations. And those are, as ever, still there. If anything, um, I, would, I would guess, and, and this is not my area of study, that those concerns have, are, are getting heightened, not diminished. Um, so that's what's behind a lot of the localization issues. The initial things about like local content and local partners, those were very commercial in my reading of it. Localization it was actually more a defense and security issue. Um, pol politicization of, of business issues also is, it, it just moves out of the commercial realm. That's why, in, in my opinion, these last two were deal killers, kind of, for some people, in ways that the first two weren't. And, and in terms of the IPR, is it getting better? Um, I, it, it's hard to say in the continuum of time. One thing I will say about China is that its intellectual property rules and laws are amongst the best and most complete in the world. The issue has always been enforcement. And so, um, you know, the, the legal system is not transparent there. So the laws are all there about IP infringement and, and their laws are, are very, very complete and correct. But then once you have a violation and you sue somebody, the court does or does not take it seriously. And even as a foreign player, if you win, you may be shocked to find the, the penalty for the violator is 500 yuan. You know, it, it's a nothing fine. And then so the, the opposing factor closes up and goes away. So, so you know, it, it's the, the IPR falling down often has been, it's the government does great, great policies, great laws, but the enforcement is not great and the legal system is not transparent, it's not consistent. The, the, the penalties are not punitive enough to deter. Um, and, and that I, I, I personally have not noted a significant change um, in that environment, better or worse. But, but that has always been, you know, the issue. You, you can't enforce it. The, the laws are there and they can always point to the laws, but enforcement is tough and it's not punitive. And it's also a bit of a black box. <laughs> uh, Bill Overhold has been very uh, patient and uh, you let me handle the questions, but Bill, uh, would you like to come in either to comment on some of these issues or to 
uh, raise a question either now or in a few minutes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> in the 1980s, Americans were terrified of Japanese industrial policy. And studies that uh, some colleagues of mine did uh, show that um, uh, Japan's industrial policy, which was at least as sophisticated as China's today, had some very expensive successes and a lot more very expensive failures. Uh, today, uh, Washington uh, uh, is as fearful of Chinese industrial policy uh, made in China in 2025 uh, as it was of Japan then. The SMIC uh, case that you, that you gave us reminds me of the greatest uh, uh, Japanese uh, industrial policy, which is the uh, fifth generation computer art artificial intelligence. And they, they made a huge investment and it was a complete waste of money. Uh, <laughs> does the SMIC example indicate that uh, as with Japan, our, our fears of Chinese industrial policy are overblown. Uh, that likely they're going to have some very expensive successes and a lot more very expensive failures. And, and maybe, maybe uh, from a competitive point of view, we should welcome the fact that they're emphasizing uh, this way forward. <laughs> oh, well, that is a, a, a great um, analogy and question, especially, you know, the China and the Japan situations have so much of similarity and also differences and, and you know, a lot to learn from. Um, you know, I, I think, and definitely Japan had a policy similar to what we see in China now, but I, I want to point out the market differences, which makes the China case perhaps today um, that much harder to, to deal with. Um, Japan, you know, flawed as it may be, um, Japan is a democracy, it's a rules-based society. Um, it's a, um, it, it's a, in many regards, a lot of the um, infrastructure of Japan is similar to the US. So we, we, we know how to, um, th we, there's not the, unpredictability factor. Actually, the unpredictability factor of China is, is, is so often the deal breaker recently for both expats in China and also foreign companies in China. China is, is governed by one party, one, one government, and, and recently one man. And, and it's, it's what he wants, it's what they want. And it's hard to predict. We don't know how they will be. And, and so this is the thing that makes it uh, scary. It's what makes it uh, difficult from a business perspective. Um, but also therein possibly lies, lies the potential of success or failure, as you mentioned. Um, you know, I watch the semiconductor industry and I do know, for example, they use the public funds as a carrot to steer the private money into semiconductors. But I also note that in, in the public money so often is used to buy land, to, used to buy plant, to, it's all non-critical issues. It's not for R&D. Um, actually, there's something, this is a detail I don't want to go into, but for a variety of reasons, public investment funds in China don't like to invest in intangible assets, R&D design teams, that kind of thing. Well, but it's the intangible assets which sh will be the key to their success. You can't make it buying land. You can't make it building a beautiful, you know, a, a 10,000 square meter clean room. And yet that's where a lot of the money goes. So, so it's that one party monolith um, that's non-transparent, which starkly di differs between China today and Japan then. 
um, in both its success and its failure. Because of its monolithic, if it needs to move fast, it can move fast and very single-mindedly. But sometimes if that single mind is wrong, then the whole thing is wrong. So, so that is a key difference that I see between the two, which, which again is both possibly a big success and at the same time, a big failure um, uh, variable. It, it's a double-edged sword, but it's, it's a market difference between the two, which requires US policymakers to be able to handle and digest that difference well. Another thing I think about the difference between Japan and China is that China just has such a huge market. So yes. that when you have 120 million people as opposed to 1.4 billion uh, for a lot of uh, consumer items, uh, it makes China much more scary. It, it does, absolutely. The stakes are higher. There's no other way to put it. The stakes are higher. You know, they were high with Japan, but there's no, no question it's higher with China. Right. Uh, here's a question about the cell phone industry. Uh, it says, talking about the scale of the cell phone industry, do you think the speed of development and the amount of inventories available on the market, do you think this business model will sustain in global aspect? Do we need more new phone models? Uh, would it be a good <laughs> idea to take advantage of Huawei ban to slow down the speed of manufacturing? The recent situation of um, WeChat ban and 5G ban had also displayed, uh, they played uh, the releasing of uh, iPhone 12. Uh, uh, Ezra, are you asking this as a consumer or as a, are you tired of paying for new phones? <laughs> I'm asking that because that's a question. I'm asking that because somebody in the audience asked that question. Okay. I'm okay. a question yeah. from the audience. Well, you know, you know, that's the tech market. Um, the speed of development and that pace was set with, with very notably Intel's Moore's Law, where um, a new generation of chips would come to market every 18 months. It kind of set a pace in the tech industry. And, uh, you know, that, that's a, it's not so much a need. Definitely, I would agree, nobody needs it. You could use your iPhone 5 and have a great life, but it's a want issue. And the consumer, um, and there's so much industry and there's so much profit tied into these wants, not needs. So, so I would just generally uh, you know, put it there. Definitely the tech industry early on um, set a torrid pace of new product cycles and new technology cycles. Mm -hmm. and, and we trace that back to Intel and their Moore's Law. But now, you know, when it comes to consumer devices like cell phones, like 5G, the streaming services, th that is very much a, a want factor, not a need factor, in, in my opinion. But, you know, there, there's, too much, um, there's too much profit and revenues at stake. Uh, you know, Alibaba's declining revenues is because they want to maintain a, uh, I mean, not declining revenues, declining profit margins is because to, to, to maintain their torrid pace of growth, they keep dipping into lower and lower margin businesses because their high margin business initially was B2B sales, but that's quite small market. So they went into B2C, which is much lower margin. And, and, and they keep going into more markets, more markets. They don't want to stop growing. You know, that's, that's a, that's a, um, that, that's a capitalism flaw, I guess. You know, big companies never satisfied with how big they are. So they got to make more wants, more needs, more products. Well, it sounds like from what you say, in the American side, they're always searching for more profits, higher profits. Oh, for sure. And Everyone is. A lot is. of the Chinese cases, they just want scale. That, yeah, they want scale, and and yeah. and yet in so many the next cases. Questions from my uh, please go on. Well, this is a, a different subject. So, if you want to have another finish, the no, no, please, Ezra. Uh, okay, the next is a question from my friend Tom Claflin. Uh, he says, "Will TSM?" This is a specific question, but it's a critical one. Will TSMC be able to continue to supply Huawei with state-of-the-art semiconductors? 
Uh, I don't believe so. I believe the way the government policies, and, and again, uh, you know, there are so many things which are being floated and so many things being decided. I, I Sometimes I lose track of what's being floated versus what has been strictly said, but I believe the, uh, and, and TSMC's own corporate um, planning is that uh, starting from actually this month, they should no longer take new orders from Huawei. And um, the orders that they have on hand, um, you know, they have, um, they've been working them through in the last three quarters and not taking new orders. Uh, but I didn't quite catch whether that is only for advanced process wafers or for all wafers. Um, but uh, definitely the advanced process wafers, mm -hmm. TSMC is no longer taking orders from Huawei. They made that uh, a statement in their investor call uh, uh, for the second quarter. Uh, here's an anonymous uh, question about the uh, recent policy toward uh, giving government money to private corporations as a way of sort of guiding their development. Uh, how and the, when, when did that begin and how did it begin? And then there's a related, a little bit different question that same person asks, what's the role of the Hong Kong stock market now? If the United States stock market becomes unreliable, uh, will the Hong Kong stock market, given all the political change and so forth, uh, be able to play a role or will this switch to the Shanghai and Shenzhen stock markets? Can uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen draw international capital uh, the same way that Hong Kong does more reliable with international law seem to do so? Uh, so uh, th those two questions about okay. uh, well, the, uh -huh. the government aid to go ahead, uh, the, yeah. the, the uh, stock market is the second question, same, same person. The first question mm -hmm. really had to do with the uh, use of uh, government aid and steering uh, capital mm -hmm. to certain companies. Uh, the uh, the public-private um, has been, uh, you know, I, it's hard for me to pinpoint exactly when they started, but I, I would say um, within the last six, seven, seven, eight years, the public-private actually first started out with the government inviting private investors to participate in public projects and private investors to take a stake in state-owned enterprises. That's how the public-private first started out. Privates were invited to join SOEs and public projects. And the reason then was that uh, about seven, eight years ago, they felt that the state-owned enterprises, the SOEs, were becoming too much like dinosaurs. They weren't but they weren't limber enough and, and competitive enough. And then so they forced SOEs to take some private investors to inject some market element into their, into their management, into their decision-making. Um, well, to be honest, that I can't think of a single success story because what happened was the private investors would go in and they would be told to sit in a corner during board meetings and were basically always ignored. Um, now, actually, in more recent years, the public-private is a different format. It's a private project. And if it's an approved project in an approved sector, they can get matching funds from a, um, from a government fund. Like, for example, the big semiconductor fund of the government. They will match um, investment, equity investment. If you put in you know, 500 million yuan, they'll put in 400 million yuan to support you. Plus, they'll arrange low-cost loans for you. So the public-private, that's been around for, I would say, seven, eight years. And it's interesting, it first got started as inviting privates into public. And now it's used as a sweetener. If you do the right thing as a private investor, I'll match your funds. Um, so, so, you know, that's been, that's been a, a, a pretty important uh, element, I would say. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange, Actually, you know, that exchange has becoming more and more red steadily over 20, 30 years. Um, even when uh, Bill and I were in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange being China. more and more red means the proportion of 
companies listed on the Hong Kong exchange, which were actually China companies, not Hong Kong companies, they were China companies, but they went and listed in Hong Kong. Um, when we were in Hong Kong then, uh, what we call red chips, um, uh, they were at that point easily, I would say 15, 20, maybe even a quarter of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Today, it's three quarters of the Stock Exchange. 75% of the weighting of the Hong Kong market is actually China companies. Hong Kong companies, traditional Hong Kong companies are only about a quarter. It's, it's completely turned around since the 1990s. Yeah, mainland companies, in order to attract international capital, yes. go to Hong Kong because international capital feels the Hong Kong market is uh, more reliable, legal. Will that continue now with the new increased uh, political control over Hong Kong? Is that yes. like Yeah, you know, international capital goes to Hong Kong, not necessarily because it's more reliable, um, because actually the Shanghai and Shenzhen exchanges are reliable. The problem is Hong China exchanges are denominated in renminbi. Renminbi is not a open currency. So you, you, you get a huge barrel of renminbi and you, you, can't, you can't go to Thomas Cook at the airport and exchange it easily, you know, generally speaking. Hong Kong dollars is an open exchangeable currency. That's why Hong Kong has always been important window. The Hong Kong dollar is, is not only an open exchangeable fluid currency, but it's pegged to the US dollar. So again, we come back to the predictability of it. The renminbi is a completely closed currency. Um, and so that's why for international funds, um, you know, uh, the, the China markets have always been a little bit a, a separate basket, not, not because they're unreliable, but because the renminbi is not convertible. Um, the Hong Kong market, I, I personally believe, actually will, will, will surge in importance. Its importance will actually increase Ironically, um, one, because China companies now feel less welcome in the U.S. market. So, for example, Ant Holdings, which China's largest fintech company, was considering coming to the U.S. to list. Now um, they've made the decision they're listing in Hong Kong. Um, so the U.S. closing its market has been a benefit to Hong Kong. And secondly, now that Hong Kong has the um, more stringent political environment and laws, ironically, China will use the Hong Kong market even more. Um, so, so for both reasons, the political changes and also the US, um, you know, uh, uh, lack of welcoming towards the uh, China markets, Hong Kong stock market, I actually expect will, will continue to grow quite well and will be a strong fifth market in China. And, and as an aside, I just want to say, I, I didn't mean that the U.S. market is unwelcoming to China. Actually, the U.S. SEC has stated very clearly, China companies are welcome, but they must make their accounting and auditing records open. So when there are shareholder suits or shareholder issues, they must be able to track their audit records as they do with any listed company in the U.S. And on this point, the China... SEC says no. Our audit records are our are, are audit records. You cannot th that they make they made that into a sovereignty issue, and so as a result, th there's a stalemate. So so you know these are fine issues and complications. It's not a matter of welcoming or unwelcoming. It's again politicization of what should be a commercial issue. You come here, your audit records should be available. They made it into a political sovereign issue. Uh, I'm afraid our time is up, but Lily, uh, thank you for uh, the broad education you've given us uh, about uh, the different companies' profits. And I'm afraid the questions we've thrown at you have come from all kinds of different directions, all kinds of different topics. And thanks in uh, uh, trying to answer all these many very different questions on a very rapidly changing subject. So I'm afraid this topic is going to remain uh, at the uh, forefront of a lot of issues now. And uh, we may be coming back to you uh, for continued lessons on this topic. And we thank Bill Overholt for bringing you here.
So thank Lee for coming. And uh, thank you, Ezra, and thank you very and, much, Bill. Uh, thanks, Bill, for getting. Thanks, Lily. Bye, bye.